And a pleasant good afternoon to you. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing okay. And welcome to this uh, second edition of our fifth season of the Works podcast here. And we are continuing our coverage of the midterm elections here, uh, not only in the state of Alabama, but nationwide as well. And so our guest today is Dr. William Boyd. He is running, seeking the Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate. As those of you who may recall, uh, Dr. Boyd had ran for Lieutenant Governor four years ago. And what I have to say, the most ensemble cast of Democrats has ever ran in the state of Alabama four years ago. And so now we are here in 2022, and he is vying to run for the U.S. Senate. Dr. Board, I really appreciate you uh, joining uh, the podcast on today. I'm honored to be here, sir, and congratulations on the fifth season. Thank you so much. Um, it's really have not been easy. We, uh, it's been so much going on, but our mm -hmm. goal is to keep people informed of the people's events, the, the people's narrative. We don't get too much of that in mainstream media. So, Dr. Boyd, um, you can uh, start by telling us who you are and why you decide to run for U.S. Senate. Well, you've already given the introduction that I need. If I could put you on the road with me, we'd be all right. But I'm Will Boyd, and I'm seeking the nomination for United States Senate. I'm a husband, a father, a bishop, and also a pastor. Uh, I joke and tell people I pastor a 162-year-old church. Uh, people always wonder if I'm the founder. I say, no, I just look that way because of politics. But uh, truly, uh, I, it's an honor to be here today. I'm running for United States Senate, as I believe every Alabaman ought to have a shot at the American dream. I began in 2016 traveling our great state when I was the nominee for U.S. House of Representatives for the 5th Congressional District. We did an outstanding job, my team and I knocking on doors. We were able to reach a lot of people in Lauderdale, Limestone, Madison, Morgan, and Jackson counties. We even outperformed the presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton, that year. So we were just proud of that effort. But of course, it was a gerrymandered district and uh, just a tough run, but we were very proud of our, our performance. We went on and, as you mentioned, uh, ran for lieutenant governor in 18, and we were able to, again, with the help of people who are listening today, pick up 660,000 plus votes. And that was a great feat for our team. But again, we wouldn't have done it without voters like yours uh, stepping out and really helping us to, to turn people out. Uh, I believe before I say anything more about where I am and what I'm trying to do, I believe there are a lot of challenges that are facing us. But one of the things I found, uh, Mr. Williams, is that most people need to understand that we have a shot at winning. And I know we'll get into the interview, but uh, the biggest shot we have at winning is every voter showing up at the poll. And I just wanna let every listener know today that we would have won in 2018 had we seen more people turn out. 337,000 plus African-Americans didn't show and Walt Maddox lost by 327,000 in terms of the variance between him and Kay Ivey. So we could have a different state right now today. Had people showed up, had we done more, had voters showed up in greater numbers, we would have seen the expansion of Medicaid. We wouldn't have seen as many rural hospitals close. We wouldn't see as many hospital beds that, that are no longer there. And we would see fully funded pre-K, a, a lottery in place so that we can fund our educational programs, fund HBCUs better, make sure we have community colleges supported and see trade schools that are really doing what we want them to do in Alabama. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come on today and, and take any questions you might have. But again, I'm running because I want every Alabamian to have a shot at the American dream, which includes educational equity. It includes having access to affordable health care, And it also includes uh, beyond that, being able to have every voice heard at the poll in a state where it seems that the African-American voice is being muted more and more day by day. So are those issues that you mentioned on the state level, are, are those would be some of the issues that you would be dealing with once uh, you become one of our representatives in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, the main roles of a United States senator are to adv provide advice and consent to the United States president, so to President Biden in this case, to also assist with 
uh, the work that is being done in the House. Of course, you have two houses of Congress. You have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. So you work alongside the House with the House uh, to make sure that legislation is passed. But in addition to that, they work towards making sure that nominees, appointees of the president, which could be generals, Supreme Court justices, we call them officials uh, in terms of the nation that would actually need to be uh, passed through nominations. These, these are the roles of senators and, and actually even go as far as to impeach presidents or high officers whenever there is a case of, of something going wrong. So that's what senators do. But in that second part of the process, yes, sir, we help to make sure that perhaps a student success plan is in motion where we would see that there would be an investment in the HBCUs, the community colleges, and as I said, the trade schools. But beyond that, we could push for, even at the state level, but also working at the US, US Senate level, funding being available for the pre-K, uh, quality pre-K for every child four to five who's not in kindergarten yet. We can work towards helping states get that. We can work towards making sure that there's a student success program that, that, that you heard people like President Obama or President Bush try to work towards a race to the top, or maybe it's a program that, that comes by law and, le and legislation that helps to make sure that student education is affordable. Right now we have a, a crisis. It's really been occurring even back in 2005 when I was last in the classroom as a professor, the cost of living was not even climbing as high as the cost of education was. So when you have education that is out of reach, when you have a, a lack of affordability of higher education, you hear President Biden and senators talking about whether or not we should uh, uh, have loan forgiveness have public service loan forgiveness programs for students in college. Yes, these are all things senators work on, making sure there's affordable health care. Now, the state works on the expansion of Medicaid. A gubernatorial candidate might talk more about that or a state senator. But there is also money allocated to the states that, that, that senators definitely have a role in when it comes to health care. So the economy is another component of that. Senators would work towards making sure that bills and legislation are there to put all United States citizens back to work as much as possible. This is why you hear Build Back Better. You might hear American Rescue Plans. These aren't unique to states, but the states adopt parts of the policy and the senators help to shape it. Uh, sounds like a lot of Republicans are not buying into this Build Back Better plan because the, the, the key word that they bring up is uh, socialism. Uh, can you expound mm -hmm. on that? What, why is that such a hot topic these days, uh, especially among uh, those who are running for U.S. Senate or U.S. House of Representatives? And Alabama is of no exception. Uh, you got Republican uh, senatorial candidates, Republican uh, U.S. House or representative, you know, candidates. You know, they're saying that there should be less government, but yet they are looking to infringe the, uh, the rights of our, our most vulnerable uh, people of color, LGBTQ+. Plus. And I, I just want to know what are your thoughts on, because uh, this is a trend that's, that's really going on. I really would like to uh, have your opinion on, that, on those uh, top of things. Well, <clears throat> uh, I taught business in the classroom as a professor. Uh, one of the things that people like to talk about on the other side of the aisle is trickle down economics. And trickle down economics involves really in a, at this basic level, believing if you have the, the richest doing better, that eventually that money flows or trickles down to the bottom. But right now in Alabama, we have regressive laws. We have regressive, I'll say practices. We have, for instance, a grocery tax that taxes uh, really the poor more than anybody else. When people who are poor, people who are in poverty, we have 800,000 people in poverty in Alabama, uh, they are spending most of their disposable income, most of their checks on food. So it hits them the hardest. For a person who is making $200,000 a year and barely buys any groceries, they could care less whether there's a, a tax there or not. So we need to make sure it's, it's, it's affordable for everybody. So that's the first thing I want to talk about, trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics just doesn't work. And what President Biden and people in this current administration want to do is build back from the ground up, from the middle out. When you work from the bottom, 
and you begin almost like a tide coming in to float boats. All boats float, all right? So when you help out and you infuse build back better plans that are in motion, what you start to see is the middle class grows, poor people do better, and the rich even do well. So we have to sell the idea that doing build back better work can actually help our state. What we saw under President Biden in 2021 alone is the biggest job growth rate that we've seen in 40 years. We saw where there are 6.5 million people, I believe, that were put back to work. Uh, we saw a growth rate of about 5.9%, somewhere in that range. That's, that's, that's unbelievable considering what we went through, uh, especially in 2021. So when people think about Build Back Better, I know they're thinking, well, let's just send checks out. Let's just cut more stimulus checks. No, that's, that's not what it's about. But you have to look at what he's saying. He's saying create more jobs, but not just more jobs. Modernize the jobs. Modernize our waterways, our roads, our ports. Build a national network where you have 500,000 electric car ports that are set up all around the nation, uh, particularly in Alabama. You wanna make sure that you're changing out lead pipes uh, so that you don't have what you have in Flint, Michigan. You wanna make sure you're providing internet access so people who are in the black belt or the wiregrass don't have to go to a Hardee's or an Arby's to get on the internet and to do homework. Uh, you, you wanted to see that $600 billion that Biden infused to make sure that he kept our country safe. These are things that are done in terms of revitalization. So when people use words like socialist, they're trying to hint that they don't want anything given away. But Social Security, uh, in name alone, is something that is a safety net. When you talk about overtime pay, when you talk about family medical leave, when you talk about all these issues that help people, these are things that Republicans and Democrats sit around and talk about at the table. These are kitchen table issues. So we have to really work hard to stop people from dividing us up, not thinking that programs that came from democratic minds are not good. We have to stop letting people put labels on us and call us socialists. We do better when we help each other. We do better when we work hard together, struggle together, as Dr. King talked about. But, but yes, we have to push forward and make sure that it's not from the top down, but we work bottom up, middle down. There's, there's a couple of things I want to bring your attention. I don't know if you are have been following. So one of the things that is trending now is you have some uh, congressional leaders like Marjor Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's about to be tried for her role in the January 6, 2021 insurrection. And so the uh, so there's talk in Congress that that some of the members of the House of Representatives in the Senate uh, may very well be following in their footsteps. So what, what are your thoughts on that? And should you be elected to the U.S. Senate? Um, should these individuals be held accountable? Everybody should be held accountable, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or independent. You have to go into the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House recognizing that you are elected to serve people. You're elected to serve your constituents. If it's a congressional district like Marjorie Taylor Greene's district, which by the way, is a continuous, contiguous state, it's next door. In case we think that's far, far away on another planet, that's right here, that's in us on our doorstep. So, so what you hear is a lot of divisive rhetoric. You hear where one person who's supposed to be speaking for over 600,000 people is dividing our nation, dividing people up. We need people who will go in and work together. So upon election, yes, once I'm sworn in, I plan on going in and, and being a part of that team that holds people accountable. It is highly probable I'm running against someone who is uh, part of that January 6th insurrection. So yes, the, this, this is a very serious thing. Our nation, uh, its democracy is at stake and we don't need, we cannot afford more division in our state or in our country. We need people who will go in and are inclusive, who are open-minded. One of the reasons why I love my party is a big tent party. You, you mentioned a lot of different silos. You would talk about one being straight. You would talk about an LGBTQIA community. You might talk about black or African-American versus white or BIPOC. Uh, uh, you might talk about several acronyms that we could all say we fall into, right? Uh, but long story short, we're all one group of people. We're Americans. And right now we need people who will 
on both sides of the aisle, help hold people accountable. That's why I'm, I'm happy that we even have balancing out people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Ken Zinger, or, or others, uh, believe it or not, uh, who, who are sh shooting on the Republican side to make sure they bring fairness and accountability. So I, I'm proud of people on both sides of the aisle who are willing to make sure we resolve these issues. So th there, there's a lot of, in, uh, in Alabama, as well as uh, other uh, states across the country, we're, we're seeing a lot of fear monkey and misinformation that's going around concerning some of the uh, the issues. You know, for example, uh, we're coming upon a year that two years that President Biden has been, you know, elected. They're still saying that the election was stolen for President Trump. Uh, you got a lot of Republicans that call themselves uh, Trump Republicans. You you yeah. have you 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 know on the other side of the corn, you know they're not really talking about the issues that are in the hearts of uh, the people. You know they're talking about you know building the wall and securing our elections, but they're not talking about you know things that are really concerning people right now. Uh, such as the high gas prices, uh, the, the the grocery tax here in the state of Alabama, um, the the open the open the Open Records Act, the Open Meetings Act, uh, making sure that uh, those who have been formerly incarcerated will have the opportunity to vote. These are these are things that are resonating with the people not only here in the state of Alabama, but uh, these have become nationwide uh, issues. Right. And so you, you're having, so you're, you're having these, uh, so you're having these, so people are, are definitely speaking out. They're, they're speaking sure. out in ways that are ma imaginable. Mm -hmm. If elected to uh, the Senate, What actions will you begin to take to deal with some of those issues that I just mentioned? You know, I know you're not going to be able to do a whole lot, you know, in, in six years, because because uh, it's it's multi layered, multi uh, faction, and it's, it's a lot that's been going on for many years that we possibly cannot solve in six years. But what's some of the things that you can do to? put Alabama and America back on the right track? Well, there are several that I would like to roll out, but let me be very specific about what you just said. Have you noticed that in election cycles, particularly that we see divisive messages, we see where campaigns and candidates are fighting each other, sometimes in the same party on the other side of the aisle about issues that don't even relate to where we are in Alabama. I have at least three or four opponents who are now running ads on television on the other side of the aisle, and all of them appear to be in a race against President Biden rather than a Dr. Will Boyd. Uh, so there's a reason for that. Second thing I want to say is look at Alabama. Notice that there are always these amendments or I'll just call them the third rail issues that keep popping up only in an election cycle or a year that we're going to vote. We could have done something about a lot of these issues a long time ago. The Republicans hold the supermajority in Montgomery. I mean, if they wanted to go in and just vote and the Democrats just sat there, they could they could do it. And I mean, they wouldn't have to be stopped by anybody. So you want to ask yourself, why do these issues keep popping up and we don't do anything? What do I believe we can do? Well, I believe, and I had the privilege of meeting him uh, in Huntsville, where I am right now, uh, John Lewis. We need to make sure we push forward uh, with, with the act push forward with things that would help make sure people can vote. I mentioned earlier, I want to mention again, I said the African-American voices are being muted in Alabama. We had people to redraw congressional lines that we know were drawn unfairly that minimized the African-American vote from 29% down to 14% in terms of representation. And yet the Supreme Court sided with that group and yet we're having now where we're saying we're still fighting to get back where we were with a, a Voting Rights Act. We need to see things like Section 5 in place where there's preclearance again. We need to see where there's automatic voter registration. 
We need to see where uh, there's curbside voting, where people can actually show up, our elderly can jump out, they can be served, and they can uh, have the proper documentation given to them. Uh, we need to see where we have people like other 29 states that are out there where there's really no major excuse, no excuse needed really for, for absentee voting. We need to see where we have people who are going to push for, as you just talked about in expansion of voting rights, ex-offenders having their voting rights restored immediately. We use words like crimes of moral turpitude, and I understand all that, uh, but, but if people have served their time, they need to make sure that they are immediately able to vote. But when we have these continuous things thrown at us, these, these ways to suppress our vote, it is not surprising, and I hate saying that, it is not surprising that so many people give up and quit. I've had where my own voter card has come in with a change in the voter location more than once. I've had where my name, even though I was a candidate on the ballot, the suffix instead of junior, JR, period, it had JR in a line at the end so I could be stopped. I've had my wife and I where we couldn't vote uh, about a year or two ago in one, one election without a fight because we were told to go to one polling place and we're very educated people. We are people who are in the know as it relates to voting rights. We know where our polling places are. So this is why going to about, uh, Going to the question again and, and, and the answer, this is why even on my website, boydforbama.com, you can actually go there and you can type in your name and we show you where your precinct location is. We show you where your polling place is and we help you even figure out if you're registered or not. If you're not registered, we help you to get there. But, but these are things that can be done before I even get to the United States Senate if we make sure we do our part to, to push hard now and to fight. Support people like the NAACP. Support people like your group who are, who are working hard to make sure the voters have a voice and we speak out. We don't have to wait until another election cycle passes. It's gonna get worse and worse until we get people like you and me to stand up and challenge the system to fight and, and make sure that we do what's right. Well, let's talk about election security. So that seems to be like one of the number one so-called issues that is servicing in our country, really something that does not, you know, exist. And you even got candidates in Alabama, you know, that, you know, they're saying that. When has there ever been a time where in, in this country was the election was ever stolen from a particular person? I cannot find anywhere in history, you know, in which that has happened. So where is that coming from? Well, it, it, it's, it's coming from people who aren't obviously happy with the election results. Uh, people thought they had an election in the bag. They thought it was over with, but obviously people spoke up. Uh, people, people's voices were heard. There's one former US president who said, there's nothing more fundamentally important than the voices of the people being heard at the polls. When people spoke up, whether they went left or right, or even independent, they, they said who they wanted to see in office but now the process is being questioned. There's another presidential candidate that said, I like the game of football because at least you can't move the goalpost. What we're seeing right now are, are goalposts being picked up, uprooted and moved to another location. So what we're seeing is, is people crying or at least upset about security. Listen, we all need to be concerned about security. Uh, one of the things that was proposed yesterday, I had the privilege of sitting in Danville uh, and, and, and while there, I was talking to some people who are seeking to be in office, one particular candidate for Secretary of State and, and others for Governor and, and State Senate, State uh, House of Representatives. But long, long, long story short, one of the things that we, we talked about was perhaps using your license to scan it and so that we know, obviously, who tried to vote in a particular county. And if that same license appears in a neighboring county, uh, they are flagged immediately and told that license has been used. And so obviously somebody's trying to commit some type of fraud or security. I have been, Mr. Williams, I have been and served in the position of County Democratic Executive Committee Chair. I had to appoint poll watchers. I had to make sure we had people who were there who would, who would stand alongside and ensure that there was election security. I had to work alongside the probate judges and and people who were assigned to be officials in our county 
to make sure the process was 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 upheld with the highest integrity. I've never seen any election fraud. I've never seen anything that's been complained about today. Now, people are going to always say that somebody tried to do something, and we actually have hearings, and we go back after the date, after the fact, and we make sure that people are who they really said they are. Uh, anytime that we had someone complaining about some uh, inappropriate activity at a polling place, uh, we immediately called uh, people out to the site. I would call a judge myself and say, I need you to go to this precinct, and they investigate it. So we need to make sure that we 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 push for security. Well, now, what one of the things that we could do is making make sure that we have a higher percentage of people working each poll. Uh, and by that I mean, if you have in a particular precinct in Birmingham where there may be two thousand people uh, who are voting on a given day, we need to make sure that a certain percent of workers are there to service that two thousand people versus another group where they might have 12 and another precinct, 12,000. You don't wanna have the same amount of people working the polls. You wanna make sure you have a percentage reflected of the population that is attending. You also, voting, you, don't, you also wanna make sure that where we know there were long lines and people have been waiting. And of course, this is where the, 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 the ideas about the water coming in and people standing in place and people being frustrated about you know, where people are in line. We need to make sure that we have people monitoring lines and are making sure they facilitate the movement of voting taking place. This is why you want early voting on Fridays, Saturdays, and Mondays, uh, as one of our candidates, uh, Pamela J. Uh, Lafayette actually, Lafayette actually uh, talks about if you want to visit her site, that's P-A-M-E-L-A-L-A-F-F-I-T-T-E.com. She's running for Secretary of State, where John Merrill is today. She's trying to get in. Uh, but again, look at her site, and you'll see things like Again, us having these measures in place to ensure that we don't bottleneck on election day. More people voting on the days before and after, or at least more people voting uh, on the days leading up to the election day. When you do all these things, you create new ways for people to vote, you do better. We also have another issue going on. We have seniors who volunteer to work. I know some people who are close to me who get up at five in the morning, they go to the poll and start working from 7 a.m. in the morning and they don't finish, senior citizens, until 7 p.m. at night. We need more younger people involved with this activity. Now, it's hard because it's not a, a, a great paying job, right? So we have to find ways to get more young people into this civic duty, into this process. And as we get more people interested, more people watching it, I, I hate to say it, but it's almost like taxes and sausage making. It's not a pretty process, but it has to be done. We get more people actively involved in it from the legislation being written and passed through people like me as a senator on the Hill to people boots on the ground in Birmingham, Jefferson County, doing what they need to do to make sure the precincts are secure. We're going to be all right. But as far as what we're seeing on the news about insecurities and, and, and election being stolen, we have to move beyond that. We're in 2022. We need to move forward. If we don't pay attention to what's in front of us, What's at stake? Yesterday I was at an event that, that had the word stakes in it. A lot is at stake. We can't be distracted by talk about an election being stolen in 2020. We need to deal with today. We can't be distracted about these issues that people are throwing up in the legislature in Alabama to get us divided and to get Democrats off message trying to defend everything the Republicans have thrown on the table. We need to stick to message. We are about jobs economy, health care, education, and voting rights. Stay on message and we'll be fine instead of all these other distractions. I'll, I'll show, we, we, we know in the past, uh, for example, Doug Jones was elected in 2017. That was also a crossover of Republicans um, you know, voting for Doug Jones, uh, a Democrat. Do, do you see something like that uh, in in this election, have have absolutely, you appealed, have, have you appealed to have you absolutely. appealed to Republicans and, and independents alike? So what what were some absolutely. of the responses yes. that you got from that? What, what Give you a response. What took place yesterday? I was in Southeast Alabama, in between, and in between events, I was able to bounce into. Uh, a setting, and I'll just be very frank and direct with you. I was invited to step into a country club and have salad in between a, a union meeting 
in, a, in a, another meeting like this one where I was talking to voters, I was to step in and have lunch in a country club. And here I am. I'm thinking I'm the African-American person here. I wonder if people are going to be looking at me funny. I'm, I'm being serious. I, I, you don't talk this way, but this is what was in my head. And believe it or not, Mr. Williams, as we're going through the process, as, as, as I'm sitting at the table, somebody points out that I'm a United States Senate candidate. And what I actually said is that uh, I'm actually, I've got a low battery message here, I'm sorry. I said, I'm, I, I'm actually the one who is running, but I'm actually the one who's not spending $25 million on commercials fighting somebody else. And do you know what? Everybody in the country club at the neighboring table turned around and said, I'm voting for you. This was actually in the, the very community of one of the people that I'm running against on the Republican side. They turned around and said, they're supporting me. So yes, it's there. As far as Doug Jones is concerned, Senator Jones was able to carry 80,000, we call them Doug Jones supporters. And so those Doug Jones supporters will likely show up for us again. We appeal because we talk about the kitchen table issues. We appeal because instead of talking about divisive things that split people up, we're talking about things that bring us together. I think at the end of the day, when you look at what I bring to the table as it relates to what I'm believing in, I'm telling people right now that healthcare reform is what we need. We wanna see prescription drugs go down. We wanna see where uh, Medicare is able to negotiate that lower prescription drug, drug cost. We're telling people we wanna see Medicaid expansion in Alabama. We saw since 2005, where there were uh, about 181 beds taken away, seven rural health care facilities that closed. Now, I don't care whether you're black, white, male, female, you are concerned when you have an accident, how long it takes you to get to a hospital. I talk about the fact that we have a high, not only infant mortality rate, but maternity mortality rate, and how we need to make sure we take better care of our women, and how we have in some places, like the congressional district I'm sitting in right now, has 125,000 women who don't have access to health care, no health care whatsoever. That doesn't even count their children. I've told you already, 800,000 people in poverty. When we talk about these issues, people see beyond an elephant and a donkey, a red versus a blue, and they say, what can we do to make sure that we improve partnerships so that we don't get to where we were even in the last year or so? You know, there's, a, there's some staggering numbers and you, you might want to do some fact checking, but one labor union leader that, that is part of a union that's about an hour and 15 minute drive away from where I am right now, uh, one of the IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers leaders, he actually quotes when he gets up to the speak a unique fact. He says there are more people living today than ever died. Now, when people hear that, they start scratching their heads. Really? Is that, can that be possible? More people are living today than ever died. All right. Think about that. But here's, here's Mr. Williamson that may shock you to tell you why I appeal across the aisle to people. Here's another stat you might not hear quoted. More people died last year than were born in Alabama. That, that's one that I heard that we can fact check together. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Think about that. That means we're going backwards. Now we can argue about COVID protocols, whether the CDC had a clear message, whether Dr. Fauci was saying what he needed to say, whether, whether any of these other people who were on the president's special task force were, were doing it right, the vice president was leading it properly. We can argue about all that stuff, but at the end of the day, there are people who are sitting at their kitchen table that have an empty chair there now where their loved one is no more. I buried almost 14 people in the last year or two alone, 14 people, 14 families affected in a 162 year old church that I pastor. That, that, that's, that's a fact. You can argue about statistics and you can make numbers dance, but you can't tell a person that their loved one is coming back when they know they buried them. We have to come together on the issues that matter and quit all of this fighting that's across the aisle. When you are, uh, I, I know you've been traveling all, you know, all over the state, and you've met all sorts of people. Can, can you give an idea of, not, not necessarily the words, but uh, their facial expressions, their body language, what what is going through 
uh, the voters mind when you have a candidate that's going before them, you know, and say, hey, I'm running for such and such. A, this is my platform. Set, set, set the atmosphere, you know, for me here. If I can, let me take you back to 2017 when Doug Jones and I and about five or six other candidates ran for United States Senate. It was what we called a year revival. You remember it. It was a year revival. And you, you, would, you would think it's funny, but it was a special election. And even a person who's actually in the studio with me today, Mr. David Person, he was actually a surrogate. So he had the opportunity to show up and speak at some forums for me. But, but you would be surprised when we walked into a room because of the camaraderie and the unity we had, the message that we were carrying, people treated us almost like we were rock stars. Now, I don't do anything for that, that, that type of prestige. You know, I, I get beat up quite a bit in politics, right? 50% of people might hate you all the time anyway. But when I step into, as I did this weekend, uh, when I step into the wire grass and people see me, not just in a country club for a few minutes, but see me on the streets talking to them, see me interacting with them when I'm checking in, me and a driver for different rooms in our, in our hotel and, and, and people are saying, I see you, I recognize you. Not just African-Americans, but white, uh, not just people who are, were, were born here, but people who are immigrants to this country, people who are working hard trying to get into uh, the, the, the American dream the way you and I are. When we walk into places, when I, I show up, people, first of all, are just excited that somebody's there to listen. Uh, the sad part is, and I'm going to be very honest, I'm a transparent person. People always say, Will, I really wish we could see, see some of your commercials on television. All we're seeing are the commercials for your opponents. Now in my head, I wanna say, I wish you would send me a check <laughs> so that I can actually uh, purchase some of those commercials. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Democrats don't have as much money at their disposal as Republicans do. And so one of the reasons why I've been driving all over the state, have a person who's driving me or just doing everything I can to get from event to event to event. It seems like I don't get to rest anymore. No weekends ever in sight is because I want every Alabamian to know that I'm gonna listen. So when I become the United States Senator, I'm not just gonna have an office in Washington, DC. I'm gonna have one obviously in the Birmingham area, one right where the Huntsville airport may be. Wanna have an office in the Wiregrass, wanna be in Mobile, wanna show people who are dealing with my captain spills down in Mobile that I can listen to them. I want to show people who are in Lowndes County whose sewage is still oozing out in their backyard until they're hooked up to a septic tank that I'm listening to them. I want to show people in Enterprise, Alabama, that I hear them, I believe in them, and that what they had a long time ago, even with perhaps the making of peanut butter during wartime, is something that we can do to, 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 to get them back on their feet and we can put more new businesses there today and help uh, those areas in the wiregrass uh, in Houston County do a whole lot better today and not just where they were yesterday. I want to see Huntsville, Alabama's all over the state. I want to see Birmingham, Alabama's all over the state where we're seeing people experience the American dream. So answer your question one more time, very succinctly to the point. People are excited when I show up. Very excited because this is this is a historic run and I believe this is the perfect year. Normally, when you say a bishop, a pastor, an engineer, uh, an African-American man running in Alabama, there's no shot. We have a clear pathway to victory. We have a shot at this. And I, I really don't want any of your callers, voters, to miss this who are on the line today. We have a path. Right now, people are frustrated with what's going on on the other side. The bickering, the fighting. The I'm as far right as I can be. You can't be any more right than me. The, the, the commercials that don't do anything but tear each other down. That's what desperate campaigns and desperate candidates do. I want to tell you who I am. I keep saying it. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. I'm a person who's going to look out for you. I believe in Alabama. I believe in every one of you. And that's why I'm traveling this state. I want to hear your concerns so that county by county, I can address them. I'm gonna quit, but everywhere I go, one of the things I've been doing is I've been telling them what they do well and telling my challenges and what we have to face. I tell them when the educational equity isn't there, when they're spending $2,900 per student instead of uh, maybe, maybe 10 or 15. I tell them when they have poor air quality, poor water quality. 
I tell them when we have opportunities to do something to make a difference in their counties. County by county have been doing this and people are excited that somebody's finally listening. Let's, uh, let's shift gears to, uh, to in the environment. Uh, you probably may not notice this, but uh, there's several Gulf states, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, uh, Tennessee, um, environmental activists and organizations have come together and uh, they call themselves, uh, let's see if I remember, uh, Gulf South for a Green New Deal uh, to address climate change in the South. Now, this does not get the publicity it deserves. And no one on the national level is really talking you know, about this. I, I do encourage you to look that up, Gov South for a Green New Deal. Uh, it's, it's something that I'm a part of. And we are addressing uh, climate change to, to its core, to its core, a whole lot of things that are associated. Is, is that something that is on your radar when, it, when we talk about the environment? Is, is that something on your Absolutely. radar that's part of your platform? And if so, can you yes, kind sir. of discuss that a little bit? When you hear my platform, when you hear me talking, giving a stump speech, when you pay attention to the president's message, one of the things you hear is educating Americans or Alabamians. I've talked about that already. I've talked about building the economy. I've talked about how we're going to grow from the bottom up, middle out. I've talked about making quality health care affordable and what we're going to do with prescription drugs. I've talked about the fight over Voting Rights Act today, number four. But number five, even though, believe it or not, the number one issue for millennials and Generation Z, and it should be, just like your Gulf New Deal, is climate change. And it should be talked about sometimes even first. Let me, let, let me, let me, let me tell you. I just mentioned Mercaptain Spill in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, I, I, I just mentioned also Lowndes County and what they're dealing with, with septic tank uh, sewage issues. Uh, we, 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 we also talked about open sewers. We don't hear that a lot. We, we have more waterways in our state. We have, uh, I just came from an area where there's Tennessee Valley Authority, where we have the Tennessee uh, Valley area that is obviously very well, very well watered with waterways. We have a lot of ports that could stand a lot of, of work being done. But let, let, let me just let me just pause here and say, I have embraced what I call an all inclusive strategy. I was with coal miners this week. And I talked to them about ways that we could work together to have greener, a greener economy, where we have the solar we, we have credits for electric, where we're pushing biofuels, where we're pushing to make sure that there are ways that we can generate energy in a cleaner way. But we also want to make sure we, we take care of those people who have put their necks on the lines and these coal miners have strike, been on strike for over 12 months. How do you pull people in our state together who are struggling? Coal, energy, that, that's green, that's clean. I've embraced an all-inclusive strategy, but let me let me let me just tell you one more time. What we need to do is make sure we free our dependence on foreign countries, and this is what going green does for us. When we push more of the solar, I, I lived in Illinois part of my, my my lifetime after I moved from South Carolina, where there were like Bloomington, uh, where you saw quite a quite a few windmills, windmill farms. I could tell you if you traveled right now towards Florence, Alabama. Uh, get into Lauderdale County, you'll find where we have solar panels that are there. We have to make sure that we make it better and friendlier for people to embrace new technologies. Right now, if a person wanted to go totally electric, uh, it's easy to say you can buy an electric car, but if I try to drive from here to Montgomery and I'm out of electricity, I'm out of power, so to speak, I'm going to have to figure out where the nearest station would be. And it's highly probable where I'm going might not have them. So it would be very, very very mindful of having these electric stations as President Biden's trying to push. We also have to make sure we understand that, that, that we have to modernize our waterways and our ports. We have to do a better job at making sure that, that we're spending money as we invest in Alabama, taking care of our natural resources. We have to make sure that we are 
stopping our waterways from being contaminated by runoff, by erosion. We have a lot of construction going on, a lot of roads between here and my home that I'll be getting back on the road in a little while. A lot of asphalt being poured, but a lot of dirt is actually eroding and, and running off into waterways. Uh, we have a lot of waterways that, 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 are, that are out there that are being contaminated by the fact that we're not handling uh, our drainage well. I passed through an area today where there was flooding and almost every week that I go through, there's flooding that we need to get some, irrigate, get, get some type of irrigation, but also get it in place where we have the pipes in process, the sewage in process to move that water where it needs to go, the overflow, the spill. So there are a lot, there are a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, and, and I believe if we embrace the, the a greener economy, we need to readjust. We need to train people for a newer economy. So that may, might mean going into uh, trade schools, going to blue collar workers and saying, how can we, almost like the Trade Readjustment Act, how can we readjust you for a new economy? If we don't, we can have a whole lot of ideas and Generation C and the millennials pushing for climate change. But when you have people at the top, like even our former president who might've pulled us out of the Paris, Paris Accord, we. We're, we might be battling in Jefferson County. Maybe you're battling on the Gulf, Baldwin and Mobile counties uh, right there on the coast. But, but, but you need people who are buying into this from the president through the legislature all the way down to our local counties. Otherwise, we're not going to get the cooperation we need and it won't work as fast as we want it to. So uh, I'm sure you're aware of the the 35th Avenue Superfund site that's in the city of Birmingham, uh, where I guess for the past 20, 25 years, uh, uh, marginalized people in that area has uh, been greatly affected by industrial pollution. And there was, you know, a point to where the state has stopped the federal government from making that area a national priority site so that they can clean that area up. But should you, if you are elected to the Senate, can we count on you to fight for those people down there and get and get those resources to those people there? We're talking about on a national Absolutely. level. Absolutely. Absolutely. National, Absolutely. National, so Absolutely. how would that be done? So what? how would that be done? Well, one without going into a, a long drawn out uh, process towards us achieving that victory, let me just say I'm I'm connected right now in the facility that I'm in. I'm connected with someone who is actually working with somebody who is a White House appointee. I, I've actually spoken to people who are part of the EPA face to face while in Selma a few weeks ago. Uh, there are people at the national level who actually pop in and out of Alabama all the time because sadly, Alabama has more than the injustices you mentioned right here all over the state, areas where things have been dumped, not just, not just air quality pollution issues, but you have, again, I keep mentioning, when you talk about a spill like Mercaptan, you have where this is seeped down into the ground where people don't have drinking water that is, that is clean. And the problem that people are having right now, and you, 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 you shift this back to the national. So let me, let me shift this to the national. I'm all for Ukraine. I'm all for making, we, making sure we stop people uh, who are aggressive from going in to take over countries in the wrong way. I'm, I'm all for stopping people who have a nuclear, a chemical, a cyber, and, and biological arsenal at their disposal from threatening to, to, to go and annex parts of country and to bomb buildings. But people that look like you and me are asking my brother, how is it that we can send billions to other countries, but we have a hard time getting clean water to Flint? How is it that we have people that we, we can send to billions of dollars in aid around the world but we have a group of people that you just mentioned who are affected, affected by industrial pollution and we've not done anything about it. We need a senator who will stand up and be a voice for the people. We need a person who will stand up and, and stand right there in the well, stand right there and declare what needs to be done for our great state of Alabama and to turn around and work alongside other states to make sure this atrocity, that this, 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 
thing that's just heinous does not occur in any more counties, first of all, in our state, but anywhere else in the United States. You uh, obviously will have some great shoes to fill because one of the most, if, if you are elected to the city, because one of the most influential senators in the United States Senate is retired, Richard Shelton. And so, uh, what can, what, what, what shifts are you ready to, you know, to make, you know, in order to create a, a new legacy and a new dynasty for the state of Alabama? And that would be uh, next to the last question. And then the last question would be is how uh, people would be able to reach you if they want to, uh, to talk to you, if they want you uh, to come to uh, an event, how would people be able to reach you? Those are the last two questions. Yes. Well, let me just say this. If you were to go to Ballotpedia, and I'm sure most of your uh, listeners, those viewing today know what that is, but go to Ballotpedia, Google Will Boyd, and what you'll see is I'm asked the question, which senator do I believe is highly influential person I can look at and say, I would like to model my future career after something along those, those words in terms of a question. And you'll see in writing, it's published, that I actually called out Richard Shelby. One of the things that we could say about him, and even though I'm running with a D behind my name and he might have an R behind his, this ought to show again that I'm willing to work with people on the other side of the aisle to make sure Alabama has what it needs. We don't need an ideologue. We don't need someone who's going to just be a face for the state someone who's going to make comments, someone who is going to uh, really just go and sit in Washington and do nothing. We don't need an outsider who doesn't even live in the state to actually be trying to represent the state. We need somebody who knows what's going on, who is willing, like Richard Shelby, even though we may have different ways in which we tackle problems, we share the same solutions. We, we believe that Alabama can do well. Alabama has the potential to be a great, greater state than it is. We believe we can shut down the things that are leading to poverty. We believe we can help to educate our state better. We believe we can build a stronger economy to where it's not just a few people doing well, but all people are doing well. We believe we can make health care truly affordable to all and not just people in certain pockets who are working good jobs nine to five, but everybody can have access to it. We believe that everybody ought to be able to vote and that a people of color aren't struggling uh, to try to get their, their voices to be heard. We believe that we can protect the environment from, from, from all the way down on the Gulf Coast through the wire grass, going a little higher into the Black Belt and up into the foothills of North Alabama. We believe we can work hard with all Alabamians to make sure we protect our environment. And it comes by me step by me stepping in, saying to a, a, a Senator Shelby, thank you for your service. Would you be willing to help be a mentor to me? Would you be willing to help me to be that representative to our great state just as you were? That doesn't mean I compromise my beliefs at the core of my values, but it just means I'm open-minded. He is probably one of the most influential people who has ever brought not only money to Alabama, but brought money to other states. We need money in Alabama. We leave a lot of money on the table, especially as it relates to things like high-speed rail uh, or transportation. So we need people who go in, particularly me, uh, as your next United States Senator. I wanna say thank you to the Voters uh, Legal Justice Watch group who are tuned in with me today, tune in with you, listen to your show for five seasons. But I wanna say if they wanna visit my website, it again is www dot B-O-Y-D-F-O-R Bama, B-A-M-A, B-O-Y-D-F-O-R-B-A, Boyd for Bama. Uh, just, just want to let you know that uh, they can visit that site. The number that I have on the site that you can actually call is 205-769-4422. You can text me there if you want me to appear at an event. You can even call, uh, a staff member may answer. Most times I answer, as you well know, you called and I've answered that, that line. So that's how people can reach me. My website even has a unique plan in, in, in motion or at least a, a platform 
to where if you want to become what we call a campaign ambassador, you'll find that we have a store there that has uh, merchandise in it, caps, T-shirts, hoodies, uh, face masks, all kinds of things. You can actually go and become an ambassador and through the team actually work to sell this merchandise, work to get the word out about our team, work to help bring campaign donations in, and it, it in turn helps you out. So, so I want to invite people, join my team, be a part of it. We believe we put together and assemble an awesome team that's going to help us win. I spent the first three months pulling a team together that's going to blow people away when they see who they are. I'm going to, right after the primary, start announcing names publicly, but we have people who are, are most dynamic, some who have practiced law in 67, 66 out of our 67 counties, some who have served on President Obama's campaign, the Biden campaign, some who were trained and attended the Bill Clinton uh, School of Public Law uh, uh, service. Uh, their records are just unbelievable. We even have people who are working in Alabama that are not part of my team, but are on the ground that we have spoken to and, 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 and encouraged who are actually running issue-based campaigns, who have helped Ossoff, Abrams, and people like Warnock to win in Georgia. So we believe voters legal justice watch team that Alabama is about to become the, the next Georgia. And just like you have a uh, Senator Warnock in Georgia, you're gonna see a Senator Boyd in Alabama and I'm gonna fight for you night and day. And I look forward to talking to you again during our next interview. Uh, we, we know that you've been busy uh, and I just want to personally say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. You didn't have to do it. You, uh, you could have turned me down. You uh, could have made no, any sir. kind of excuses or whatever. But the fact no, that you're no, here no. says that, you know, you, you, you're you willing to just open yourself up, you know, to oh, anyone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes. I really appreciate that. And as always, as we tell all candidates here, we are, we are, we're nonpartisan, so we invite, right. you know, no matter what party you in, no matter what office you are, are seeking, you're welcome to come on here. This is a platform for everybody. And we don't endorse candidates here. Right. Only thing we do right. is that we invite people to come in and they share their story, they share their vision, they share their platform. And you as the voters, you get to decide who do you want uh, to support or who you want to vote for. That's all we do here. So Dr. Bart, I just want to thank you so much for uh, being part of this. Uh, looking forward to following your campaign, you know, as well. And you have yes, the sir. contact information. So for those of you who will probably be watching uh, later on demand, uh, I do encourage you to research all of the candidates who are running. Research, research all the candidates. Let, let us be intelligent about who we're voting. We can't be, uh, we got to stop this blind vote. You know, really, you get to know your candidates. And sometimes you have to get to know them on a personal level. That's the only way that we will intelligently, intelligently know who is the right person to lead us and to represent us. So Dr. Board, again, thank you so much. And we'll be following oh, you on you. the campaign camp, campaign trail in the coming weeks and months to come. And don't forget, all right, sir. The primary is on May 24th, so that's about 30 days from now. Thank yes, you sir. so much, and we'll see you. Thank next you. Time. See you next time. Take care. <laughs>